In your house, Canadian Stampede is considered one of the very best, if not the best, pro wrestling show of 1997. It's quite a bold statement to make, saying we also had the likes of Halloween Havoc 97, Starcade 97, In Your House Bad Blood, and the debut of ECW on pay-per-view with Barely Legal, followed by Hardcore Heaven 97. How could this In Your House show, the last In Your House event to be only two hours long and feature only four matches, possibly receive the accolades that it does? Well, apart from the in-ring action being excellent from start to end, Canadian Stampede has one of the most unique atmospheres you'll ever see at a WWF pay-per-view. The location and venue played into the WWF's biggest storyline of the year, and so we end up with a show that's like nothing we'd ever seen before. When bad guys Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation returned to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, they were given a hero's welcome, the complete opposite crowd response that the Hearts had been getting back in the United States. Along with the insanely hot crowd, Canadian Stampede featured some of the best in-ring work the WWF had produced all year. So today I want to cover every match along with the critically acclaimed 10-man tag main event. In Your House Canadian Stampede was held in Calgary, Alberta, Canada on July 6th, 1997 in the Calgary Saddle Dome. Canadian Stampede was the fourth WWF pay-per-view held in Canada. Canadian Stampede, however, was a little more interesting because the event was held in Calgary, Alberta, home of the Hart family. Stu Hart had been promoting wrestling in Alberta going all the way back to the 1940s with Klondike Wrestling, a promotion that would change its name over time to Big Time Wrestling, Wildcat wrestling, and finally in August of 1967, Stu Hart's promotion would get renamed to Stampede Wrestling. The WWF named their 16th In Your House show Canadian Stampede to pay tribute to Stu Hart's wrestling promotion, a true cornerstone of the Canadian wrestling scene, before Vince McMahon swooped in and Stu Hart sold the territory. And also, the event was named after the annual Calgary Stampede Rodeo and Exhibition that kicks off on the first Friday of July every year. The fans who attended Canadian Stampede on July 6th, 1997 were, of course, loyal fans of the Hart family, and the fans would get treated to some great wrestling before the Hart's homecoming took place in the main event. Before continuing on, I'll just mention that there was actually five matches held on the night of Canadian Stampede, but only four made it to pay-per-view. In the free-for-all, the Godwins defeated the new Blackjacks, Bradshaw and Barry Windham, in around five minutes or so. Thankfully, it isn't a match you need to see, and it's probably a good thing that it was left off the card. The opening video for Canadian Stampede, then, does a great job in showing us how the landscape of the WWF had been changing. The video is all about grey areas, how there's no black and white in the World Wrestling Federation anymore, how there's no good guys and how there's no bad guys. It's a good opener, it's a little more creative than the usual videos the WWF would produce at the time to open up their shows. After we see Jim Ross, Vince McMahon and Jerry Lawler wearing a comically oversized hat, the show starts off with a rematch from the 1997 King of the Ring finals. It's Mankind vs King of the Ring winner Hunter Hearst Helmsley. The Mankind vs Triple H King of the Ring finals let us see a different side to Triple H, a much more urgent and rather violent side to the Greenwich Blue Blood that would serve him well as Hemsley morphed into the game in the years that followed. Hunter, however, wouldn't have won the King of the Ring if it wasn't for China. The ninth wonder of the world hit Mankind with the King of the Ring scepter during the bout and this sure did help Triple H in winning the King of the Ring finals. After the match, Triple H destroyed destroyed Mankind with the King's Crown, so Mankind was trying to get a little payback at the Canadian Stampede show. Along with this, the WWF were trying, and succeeding, in getting Mick Foley a little more sympathy through a series of sit-down interviews. The WWF were not shying away from Foley's past, and this helped in making Foley seem a little more human, especially for fans who hadn't seen Mick's work as Cactus Jack. While the King of the Ring was perhaps all about establishing these new traits 
States for Mankind and Triple H, their match here at Canadian Stampede was an all out brawl and in my opinion, this match here is one of the most overlooked and underappreciated pay per view openers in history. Now it isn't perfect, there's quite a bit of interference from China but it's still very, very good. The match starts off with a fist fight between the two competitors, Mankind gains the upper hand and we see Foley pull off a face crusher and his double arm DDT within the opening moments of the bout. After nailing the DDT, Foley taunts Triple H by doing the Helmsley pose and this gets a great pop from the audience. It doesn't take long for the fight to spill to the outside where Foley pulls off his signature elbow drop right in front of the Hart family. Any Hearts who weren't involved in the main event had ringside seats but we'll come back to this in the main event. China looks on as Mankind stays in control. Helmsley gets thrown out of the ring once again and this is enough to make Triple H walk back up the entranceway. Foley gives chase and Hunter ends up taking a suplex on the ramp. Hunter tries to get back in with a sunset flip but Foley counters with the mandible claw. It looks like it's already all over but China nails Mankind with a forearm. This gets a round of boos from the audience. Foley goes to the outside to confront China and he thwarts Hunter's attempt at a snake attack. The numbers game then comes into play when Hunter launches Mankind into China. China shows off her strength by slamming Mankind onto the ring steps and Foley lands really awkwardly on the steel. Hunter hits Mankind on the leg with the steel chair. The cameraman missed this spot unfortunately but it becomes clear that Helmsley's battle plan is to now focus on the injured leg. It's an all out assault here. Mankind does the old leg buckling spot when he gets Irish whipped and I always felt this was a really effective way of selling an injured wheel. Hunter locks in a figure 4 but the referee breaks it up after Triple H gets caught cheating. Helmsley then goes for the pedigree, Mankind reverses it but Hunter kicks Foley into the turnbuckles while Triple H remains grounded. This ends with Foley headbutting Triple H between the legs. Mankind then begins firing up and Foley remembers to sell the leg when he hits a running knee strike in the corner. Hunter gets nailed with a forearm while in the tree of woe position and Mankind then hits a pile driver that gets a really great crowd reaction but it only gets him a two count. The match again goes to the outside. Foley tries to use a chair but his plan backfires resulting in Triple H hitting Foley on the leg with the same steel chair and China also hitting a clothesline. Even after all this punishment Foley is still able to apply the mandible claw when Hunter goes to the top rope but once again China is there to save Helmsley. The match goes to the outside for the final time. Hunter beats up Foley a little and Mankind gets dumped over the guardrail. The ref calls for the bell and both men get counted out. China, Helmsley and Mankind then fight in the audience after the match. Hunter gets busted open in the middle of the chaos as the first bout comes to an end. In my opinion this was miles better than the King of the Ring final and it was a great bout to get the Calgary audience hyped up for what was to come. We see clips of the Calgary Stampede festivities. The Hart Foundation were put on a WWF float and paraded around the streets. We see Bret Hart meeting his fans and signing autographs. We see the hitman showing up at the Stampede grounds. When Bret said the Hearts were heroes in Canada, the man wasn't lying. This all played really well into what the WWF were trying to do with the Hart Foundation being heels in America but baby faces everywhere else. The Hart Foundation then get interviewed backstage. Handsome Doc Hendricks says there's a lot on the line here, the hearts could get embarrassed in their hometown and the hitman tells Doc to stop being stupid. Steve Austin then shows up and Brett says the hearts won't go after Stone Cold when it's 5 on 1, they'll wait until they're in the ring and it's 5 on 5, again a very babyface thing to do. Back in the arena we get ready for our next match, it's Takamichi Noku versus the Great Sasuke. This one is quite interesting, Sasuke is the founder of Michinoku Pro and Taka worked for the promotion around the same time period. The WWF wanted to compete with WCW's cruiserweight division so Vince McMahon wanted to show some more high flying action while also eventually bringing back the light heavyweight championship belt from Japan. The Great Sasuke vs Taka Michinoku was the first WWF light heavyweight match of this era and it's quite strange that Vince would put these two guys in a WWF ring on paper 
pay-per-view without a single warm-up match or a single dark match. Still, the gamble paid off. Sasuke vs Taka at Canadian Stampede was an exciting match and it got a lot of fans talking. There's been mixed reports about the great Sasuke's relationship with the World Wrestling Federation. Rumours suggest that he was in line to become the light heavyweight champion, but because he bragged about winning the title before it was even reintroduced, the WWF decided to go with Taka instead. We can't confirm this though, so take it for what it is. One thing is for sure though, Sasuke was positioned to be the poster boy for this new light heavyweight division early on, but the fans gravitated towards Taka Michinoku. Both men performed extremely well here, but for whatever reason, Taka came out looking better. Before the two men lock up, Mankind and Hunter Hearst Helmsley begin fighting again in the audience. The WWF clearly wanted to continue this rivalry past Canadian Stampede and that's exactly what would happen. I plan on covering the whole Foley vs Helmsley feud in a future video though so look out for that one soon. Michinoku is on the defence for the early portion of the match as Sasuke shows off some lightning fast kicks. The audience goes a little quiet when the two men begin working submission moves but there's a loud gasp when Sasuke hits a perfect spinning back kick. Sasuke locks in a half Boston Crab but Taka makes it to the ropes. A few more kicks from Sasuke are followed by Taka slapping his opponent across the face before Michinoku hits a few drop kicks to a grounded Sasuke. Taka tries to act like a heel by putting his hands up and laughing but the audience actually cheers for him. The crowd are simply appreciative of the in-ring work and they don't really care about good guys versus bad guys. Taka gets launched out of the ring with a high angle back body drop and Sasuke follows up with a martial arts kick from the top rope. And back inside the ring, Sasuke delivers another series of kicks and the last one hits Taka hard and I mean it hits him really hard. Taka went into this match looking like the natural underdog especially because we didn't know any of their backstory, but this kick here done a lot to garner Taka some sympathy. When Michinoku fights back and he hits a springboard plancha, the audience are completely on his side. This was a great move too, the amount of distance Taka got here was incredible. Back inside the ropes, Taka reverses a German suplex by landing on his feet, and he follows up with a Frankensteiner that only gets him a two count. Sasuke then hits a cartwheel back elbow before hitting a springboard moonsault to the outside. When the two men eventually get back inside the ring, Taka hits a belly to belly suplex and a top rope drop kick and then Michinoku signals for the end. Taka hits the Michinoku driver but Sasuke kicks out and the great Sasuke nails a lion salt and the match then ends with Taka taking a tiger suplex. It was a gamble bringing these two in on a WWF pay per view but it seriously paid off. If the WWF could keep this momentum going forward with their light heavyweight division then WCW would have some serious competition. This is a great bout but I do have one small complaint. It isn't about what happened in the ring, it's more about the commentary during the match. McMahon, Lawler and Ross did absolutely nothing to educate viewers at home about who these two really were and what they had done in Michinoku Pro. And this is where having guys like Mike Tenay or Joey Styles really pays off. Still a really different match for WWF standards and a match that comes highly recommended. These two would meet again the next night on Raw and Sasuke would once again get the win, but just like their Canadian stampede bout, the fans still favour Taka over Sasuke. Before moving on to our next match, we once again see Triple H and Mankind beating each other up, this time it's outside the arena. The two men beat the tar out of each other and this spot here with Mankind getting thrown into some beer kegs looked particularly painful. Moving on, we have a WWF Championship match, The Undertaker vs Vader. At the King of the Ring pay-per-view, The Undertaker defeated Nation of Domination leader Farouk to retain the WWF Championship. On Raw the following night, Farouk demanded a tag team match against The Undertaker and and Ahmed Johnson, the two men that Farouk said he hated the most in WWF. The following week, the tag team match took place and in the end, Ahmed Johnson turned on The Undertaker and he joined the nation. The Undertaker vs Ahmed Johnson was booked for Canadian Stampede but Ahmed got himself injured during a brawl with the DOA. So Ahmed lost the opportunity to wrestle for the WWF Championship at Canadian Stampede. And so Vader stepped in to take his place. It 
It sounds harsh saying that Undertaker vs Vader is probably the weakest match on this card, but this doesn't mean it's bad, it's actually one of Vader's better WWF performances. By this point in 1997, we all knew we weren't going to see the Vader that dominated Japan and WCW. The WWF had done a lot to water down everything that made Vader so intimidating and along with this, it looked like Vader's confidence had taken a big hit after that infamous SummerSlam match with Shawn Michaels. Still, he had a good bout here with The Undertaker, the Phenom was dealing with Paul Bear in the looming debut of Kane, and because Vader was associated with Paul Bear, it made sense to slot the Mastodon into the match. The audience in Calgary loved The Phenom, and the dead man started off strong and the crowd popped for every single move The Undertaker pulled off. It turns into another story of the babyface trying to overcome the numbers game. We see impressive top rope moves from both the champion and the challenger, and the arena begins completely rocking when The Undertaker tries to mount a comeback at around the 10 minute mark, so much so that the hard camera begins shaking when Vader goes for the Vader bomb. The Undertaker gets up and he counters with a middle rope choke slam. Vader kicks out of not one but two choke slams, but the tombstone pile driver puts the big man away. Just seeing The Undertaker tombstone Vader is a real sight to see. And so we get to the main event and it's probably the reason why you clicked on this video. There's still around one hour of time remaining on the pay per view so you know you're in for a real treat here, from the entrances all the way to the final bell. At the King of the Ring, Bret Hart challenged any five American superstars to step into the ring with the Hart Foundation at Canadian Stampede. Ken Shamrock, Goldust, The Legion of Doom and Stone Cold Steve Austin would end up coming together to face the Hearts. And without disrespecting the five men and Team America here, this really wasn't the absolute best babyface team the WWF had to offer at the time. You have to remember though that these guys were getting booked to lose and the WWF still had to protect their biggest babyfaces when the company returned to the United States, so it makes sense to sacrifice a few lesser superstars for the greater good perhaps. Of note here is that Shawn Michaels was absent from Canadian Stampede. He and Bret Hart had that well documented backstage fight and Vince told Shawn to take a a few weeks off to cool down, so who knows how Sean would have fit into this pay per view had he been around at the time. I know I've harped on about this already in this video, but to really appreciate Canadian Stampede, you need to appreciate how Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation would rip apart American wrestling fans on weekly WWF television. Bret felt the fans of America turned their back on the hitman, but Bret would also say that the fans across the border still valued him and the rest of the hearts. Canadian Stampede was designed to show the world that Canada still loved the hitman, and boy, I'm not sure anyone could have predicted the reaction the Hart Foundation got during this 10 man tag main event. There hasn't been an atmosphere like this at a wrestling show since. The closest thing I could compare it to, in the WWF at least, would be the CM Punk vs John Cena Chicago match at Money in the Bank 2011. Team USA have an interview before the match, they all seem united as one with the exception of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Austin walks away from the team before Doc Hendricks gets a chance to ask a few questions. The Canadian national anthem is sang in the ring by Farmer's Daughter, a Canadian country music group who I've personally never heard of before but still, the message is sent loud and clear. This is hard family territory and this one is all about Canada being better than America. Howard Finkel acknowledges Stu and Helen Hart sitting at ringside before the Hart Foundation's opponents make their way to the ring. Now, it isn't an absolute hostile reaction here, the fans aren't completely booing the hell out of Team USA, but they aren't overly welcoming either. I love Steve Austin's entrance here by the way, he's just talking smack while laughing all the way to the ring, and he's playing the role to perfection. The first Hart Foundation member to get introduced is Brian Pullman, and I can talk about the insane reactions each member of the Hart Foundation gets here, but I won't do that. Instead, I'll just say that each and every member gets treated like a main event megastar as the Hearts line up the entranceway one by one. When the Hitman comes out, the crowd response is simply insane. You'll never see a homecoming like this in wrestling. The Hart Foundation got the biggest babyface pop of the year, even though they were heels. Truly outstanding stuff here. 
The two teams come face to face but when the smoke clears we are left with Bret Hart and Steve Austin. The two trade punches and Bret gets the upper hand. When Austin finds himself in the corner getting a beating from the hitman, the hard camera again begins to shake due to the crowd once again going totally nuts. Jerry Lawler screams that the building is shaking as Austin gets a little payback. Stone Cold flips off the fans before Bret comes back with a clothesline. Bret gets cheered for everything he does here. It doesn't matter if Bret fights fair or fights dirty, everything gets a pop. Stone Cold hits a low blow and he gives a cheeky little smile to the Calgary audience after doing so. Austin locks in the million dollar dream and the two men reenact the finish of their Survivor Series 96 match but this time Austin kicks out. Brad tags in Jim the Anvil Nethart and Austin tags in Ken Shamrock. We get a little spot here where the Anvil tries to go toe to toe with the world's most dangerous man but it's no use. Brian Pillman gets cheered when he breaks up an ankle lock attempt and the loose cannon also laughs in Ken Shamrock's face. The anvil is simply outclassed by Shamrock so Pillman gets tagged in and again it's another great ovation. The Hart Foundation can do no wrong here. Pillman bites his opponent, he spits on Shamrock. Shamrock gets mocked when Pillman pretends to make Ken top out. Pillman is completely working heel and the fans love it. A belly to belly suplex forces Pillman to tag in Owen Hart as Shamrock tags in Goldust. And the commentary team don't even bother to try and talk as the saddle dome breaks out and allows Owen chant. Owen hits an enziguri but it only scores him a two count. Steve Austin begins taunting the other Hart family members at ringside as road warrior Hawk begins working over Owen. The king of hearts applies the sharpshooter but Animal breaks it up. This leads to the European champion Davy Boy Smith getting tagged in. The bulldog hits the running power slam but Goldust breaks it up. Animal comes into the match along with Bret Hart. So now everyone has stepped into the ring and everyone has experienced this unique crowd inside the saddle dome. Eventually the match breaks down and Steve Austin brings Owen Hart to the ring post while the referee was distracted. Bruce Hart, who is sitting at ringside, tries to stop Austin from destroying Owen's leg but it's no use. Stone Cold does a number on Owen and Bret tells the Hart Foundation that Owen is hurt. Owen gets removed from the match so it's now 5 on 4. Austin hits the Stone Cold stunner on Bran Pumman but Bret drags Austin to the ring post for some payback. It's now Stone Cold's turn to take punishment as the hitman hits Austin's leg with a fire extinguisher before locking in the figure 4 around the ring post. As the match continues, Steve Austin is forced to go backstage. It looks like we now have a 4 on 4 match as both Owen Hart and Steve Austin have received injuries. We get a little fan service when the Hitman and the Anvil display some double team offence and I like this spot here where Brian Pillman completely stops Ken Shamrock from going after the Hitman's ankle. Pillman also threw Shamrock into the announce table and this looked pretty good too. Steve Austin hobbles back down to the ring and he wants tagged in and we once again get to see Brad and Stone Cold face to face. Steve gets the upper hand this time but eventually Brad turns it around. Brad applies a sleeper but Stone Cold gets out with a jawbreaker. Road Warrior Animal breaks up a sharpshooter attempt and when Stone Cold applies a sharpshooter of his own it's Owen Hart who comes back down the ramp to break up the hold. Owen gets tagged in and Austin sends the King of Hearts over the top rope. Austin then begins beating Owen up in front of the Hearts. Bruce Hart throws a drink over Austin but Stone Cold goes after Stu. This results in the Hart brothers beating up Austin at ringside. Stone Cold gets thrown back into the ring and Owen rolls him up for the victory. The Hart Foundation win via pinfall. Hart family members get into the ring to fight Team USA but officials break it up. Steve Austin and company are eventually sent back up the entranceway and a celebration takes place inside the ring. Stone Cold comes back with a steel chair. He manages to hit the anvil but the remaining hearts jump on Stone Cold. Austin ends up getting handcuffed and Stone Cold is once again escorted back up the ramp. The show comes to an end with the whole Hart clan coming into the ring. Everyone is here, Stu Hart, Helen Hart, even young Davy Boy Smith Jr, Teddy Hart, Tyson Kidd and Natalia can be seen in the ring celebrating as Canadian Stampede comes to an end. 
Canadian Stampede brought in around 165,000 domestic pay-per-view buys, which was the second biggest in your house buy rate of the year, the first being Bad Blood. While on the grand scheme of things it wasn't a big pay-per-view in terms of sales, it done a fantastic job of encapsulating the main WWF storyline of 1997. The whole event went on to receive critical acclaim from the wrestling media and wrestling fans. The tone of Canadian Stampede was so different that you can't help but get excited during the 10 man tag main event. Needless to say, if you consider yourself a fan of pro wrestling, and that is old school wrestling and modern wrestling, Canadian Stampede simply needs to be seen. Whether you're a fan of the hearts or not, you're still going to be very, very entertained from start to end. It's events like this that help reinforce the statement that 1997 was one of the very best years in the history of the World Wrestling Federation. Thank you for watching and take care.